All right. Mic's on. It's a good start. Well, uh, let me welcome everybody. I'm John Dixon. I'm our presenter today tackling a, a particularly ish, interesting and thorny issue uh, uh, about training of developers. And uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. So two or three things. Uh, I'm going to rush through a bunch of numbers here. I'm going to uh, jump into some of the very interesting things that, that came out to us in the survey. And I want to leave a good 10 minutes at the very end for uh, uh, questions and answers. So uh, I know we got a bunch of friendly faces in the audience and uh, look forward to having some tough questions at the end. Uh, okay, real quickly, my background, this is I think my eighth, seventh or eighth AppSec conference. This is instead of a high school reunion, I go to AppSec USA conferences and see all my friends from all over the world. Uh, um, so I've been one of these OAuth guys forever and uh, security professional, ISSA distinguished fellow, uh, what my, I actually do in my day job, along with guys like Greg and others, is run the company. So I, this is the fun part of what I do. Day in, day out, is I'm one of the business owners and leaders at Denim Group. And um, really what I do is I'm a dad, and I have a seven-week-old uh, son back in San Antonio. And I'll just say my, my wife is particularly excited that I'm away for three days in New York. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, so she said, make it count, is what her encouragement was uh, last night. So thank you, thank you, wife. Uh, anyhow, um, so our background is we're one of these players who've been in uh, OWASP uh, world for a long, long time uh, doing application security services, software security services. Uh, one difference is we actually build, we do a lot of building and remediation around code too. So uh, a lot of what we, I have learned about uh, training and software development. Software security is from our own teams. So out of our 90 odd folks, uh, 60 of them are actual software developers and have come from that background. Uh, so as we delivered this particular survey, we learned things from our own team that we didn't really anticipate. So uh, with that in mind, we'll get going. So what, what kind of got me inspired? Uh, for those that don't remember, uh, Bruce Schneier, and that's a particularly ominous picture of Bruce for the record, uh, he put out a blog post back in March that basically said, hey, you know what, user awareness training is just a vast waste of, you know, company resources. Uh, you know, it's pretty provocative. It said there's a bunch of other things we should do. We shouldn't leave it to the, the, uh, the users um, and that there's a lot of money spent at this. It's a feel-good activity and yet no impact. Uh, Ira Winkler kind of tried to rebut that. But I read that from a different way. You know, not user uh, awareness training, but more from a, the software development side and secure development side. Like, really, we really couldn't answer that question. And so, in the spirit of uh, open and honest communication here, we're one of the vendors that actually does e learning and classroom training for developers. And guess what we get asked frequently from our clients? What is the impact of your training so I can justify to my bosses? And guess what our answer was? I used to call this in the Air Force the two-shoulder salute. I don't know. I mean, like, we really had no great answer. So this thing inspired us, and I said, you know, this would be a fun thing to do. Here's the other thing that's very interesting from a vendor standpoint. We did not know the end results. So we, we, there was a lot of folks on our side in our internal team that said, hey, this may not be a great idea. We may get uh, results back that are not particularly compelling as a vendor. So there is a little bit of... Uh, of, of, of background there that was just cautionary. So the other thing that we learned real quickly, just to distinguish uh, user awareness training from software security or software development training, is there's a couple of key, key impact differences. Number one, um, and they're both, I guess, trying to change behaviors, trying to change user behaviors and clicking on things or you know, the phishing attacks, or in the case of software developers, how uh, software developers build code, except there's a, a big difference. And I think all of us know this in the room. The software teams have the ultimate uh, power, they have more power. They have more power to say no. They have more power to swing deadlines and release schedules in front of security folks. So I don't think general users can do that. Uh, but, but software teams uh, frequently do that, where they say, hey, I'd, like, I'd love to do that, but you're going to have to catch me in February when we have the major release out. It happens all the time. So they use that, and that's, that's, that's just a reality. Uh, and, and they have, and, and because many of those features and functionality have been represented up to the business units or business unit, uh, you know, things, they have a CFO and CEO uh, visibility. So that's one thing. Here's the other thing that we know and have learned is that, you know, even though it's infrequent, 
or should be more frequent, but it is infrequent, it's much more disruptive. So it's one thing to take, you know, do a 15 minute snippet or video, or here's your click on this link to learn a little bit more about, about phishing. Uh, most of those aware, you, general user awareness training are very small and they're easily consumed in the course of a normal workday. The average class for general.net and general Java security is two days for most vendors, one to two days. Uh, the typical course length of the similar e-learning is anywhere from four to eight hours. So right off the bat, in order to program or to develop in, secu in a secure way, it's just a much bigger learning activity, right? And so, you know, that's what the development managers understand and they push back and they say, wait a second, I'd love to do this, but this is a project. And as a result, it makes it harder to do the, the training. But in spite of that fact, Training is mandated, you know, PCI DSS is probably the, the one example, and if you noticed the, th the third bullet there, they've just added in the 3.0, you know, hey, you know, we need to go and, and find out whether or not these developers actually understand these concepts. And I know PCI is not a panacea, but for the record, and the other vendors know this, that the majority of purchasing of, of formalized secure development training is directly or indirectly driven from PCI. To put it another way, there's very little best practice purchasing of secure development training. Nice way to put it. Outside of NSA or outside of like dot .mil or certain places. So, so here's the reality is uh, training is something that is a thing that we do. You know, it's mandated by PCI. Training is a feel good activity, right? Uh, you know, to some degree it's something that we can do, but here's the problem. The results are typically not measured. And that's not only the case with training, for development and security and development, but also HR impact in general. So one of the things we learned throughout this process is that large scale uh, you know, change uh, and training is, is just really rare and being able to measure, you know, even HR training, uh, EEOC awareness training, there, you know, there, there is a very uh, tenuous line between training and impact and across the board and specifically in what we do and that's the software security side of the house. On top of that, there's just really not a culture of measurement in this. So, so not only can our clients can't measure the impact, we can't measure it all. So the starting point for this entire discussion is virtually no data and virtually n nothing. So, um, so here's the other thing that makes it interesting. Uh, as we went along, we re recognized that some of these are statements of the obvious for us in the, uh, here, but it bears repeating. Number one, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I mean, this career field, software, software development, is going to increase another 30% in the next 10 years. And most of those people, most of those new entrants are going to be not from this group, not from your current population of software developers. They're going to be net new folks, either primarily out of uh, higher ed. Uh, so as a result, you're going to have, even if you solve the problem right now or do a, a scorched earth training policy, you're still going to, you're going to have the same problem two years from now. On top of that, this was the one that jumped out at me, I did not know this, is the turnover in our particular space is much worse than industry at large, which is about 14 to 15 percent. Um, and then IT, a little bit more than that, but in software development, we know this anecdotally, uh, and the statistics back this up, is that the churn is much greater. So you add the net new entrance and the churn, and you have a particularly interesting problem, which means if you, again, yeah, I use the scorched earth term, but if you really did a focused software security training initiative in 2014, if you look up in 2017, there's a very good chance that 50% of the people that you trained are no longer with the company. So that, that, that makes it very difficult. And um, so, and, and the other thing is business units, uh, CEOs and CFOs are not looking to spend more money right now, right? I mean, what is the first thing that gets cut in a downturn for all those who are here in 2008? It's training budgets, right? So uh, that's another challenge that exacerbates this problem. So turnover and growth make this a, a challenge. I won't talk about kind of how bad application security is and all that. I mean, the, the managers get that, we get that. So let's talk about the research itself. And I'll jump into the approach, how we tackled this and then some of the results, some of which we felt were fairly straightforward and others that were jumped out at us as well. 
Number one, we really looked at software developers. And we were trying to find software de developers that hadn't been trained on software security, uh, greenfield uh, uh, developers. That was hard to do, first of all. It was not a particularly easy process. Uh, we also wanted to, to look at some, the reason why we wanted to look at greenfield developers or uh, the, un, the unwashed masses is because we wanted to capture the before and after. We'll talk about that in a second. But basically, we were trying to capture with the before group their awareness of software security concepts. You know, had they been exposed and, and, and did they understand basic concepts? And one thing we thought about, first of all, is maybe we could do a code snippet. You know, we could do, that would probably be the best indicator of somebody's ability to understand these concepts. Is it before, here's a code snippet, and then after training, could they, could they create code in a non-vulnerable uh, way? Unfortunately, the realities of multiple uh, plat platforms, multiple uh, development languages makes that virtually I mean, just impractical, if not impossible. So instead what we did is we picked a set of questions that I'll show you that we think are representative. Like, like if you understand these questions, you will understand uh, the concepts. So we interviewed about 600 software developers, uh, some in person, some in classroom settings, some in uh, online uh, forums via the venerable soft, uh, uh, survey monkey. Uh, and we got a great smattering of vertical uh, representation. Now, there's some regional bias, and I'll, I'll grant you that. You'll see it in the numbers. Uh, we're based in San Antonio, Texas. I didn't mention that. So we're going to have a disproportional uh, representation of energy. That's just, we're Texas. Uh, so some of that jumped out, and I'll show you where that did. And we also have a fair amount of public sector workers that were represented in here, uh, more so than what we anticipated. And we'll see what that, how that manifests itself. So we did, uh, we started this process probably uh, early part of July. And the interesting thing is we did have classroom training uh, uh, environments. We had three big classroom training environments. So we got to actually talk to the people and interface with them. So there was a little bit of a personal touch uh, to that as well. I didn't deliver the training, but our guys did. And for those that know Dan Cornell, our CTO, he actually did one of the training classes too. Uh, and a huge, uh, interesting finding in one of those too. So here's our demographics. Um, and again, we had 600 employees. We, we spent uh, 600 developers. We spent a tremendous amount of time uh, approaching uh, groups, approaching companies. Uh, we put this out on social media. Uh, if you look at the far right uh, area, most of them were software developers. Uh, but we did get a, a, a strong uh, grouping of quality assurance and architects as well. And then a lot of others, people that I guess ambiguous in their career choice or identification uh, other I, you know like like honestly these are people that either were you know software developers or went to software developer training and maybe they just kind of got got pulled in through but we we intentionally did not target security professionals network security guys project managers and in spite of that we still got this great representation of other so i have a lot of empathy for uh you know the guys that actually the political scientists that actually do uh you know s samples and you know these people that don't know whether or not terrorism is good or bad or other you know like there's this kind of funny things that come out in these particular ones so this is okay so this is the thing that jumped out at me at first we had a what i i would I would say a substantial representation of folks over seven years. In retrospect, what we should have done is we should have broken it up another tranche of uh, above seven years. Obviously, we didn't want to ask how old they were because that shouldn't matter, although uh, it's very interesting. Uh, there is a correlation there. Uh, but the vast majority, we had a vast majority of folks were had more than seven years experience. We think that's colored by two reasons. Number one, I, I mentioned the regional uh, bias uh, for energy sector. Uh, our observation is most software developers in the energy sector are much older. Than if you go to a startup in San Jose, they're all 22. If you go to some of the big oil companies in Houston, they are 42 or 52. That's just a, a, a fact. I mentioned the same thing with a, uh, uh, the public sector. And uh, we, I've actually done speaking as his Dan in public sector environments. And I did a presentation in March in front of the very large, in front of a very large state agency. And I was the youngest person in the group. And I'm 48, for the record. Uh, 48, and everybody was north of me. So, so I think that like this is the thing that jumped out at me. Wait a second, this is so we're continuing the survey, and we're going to target. Uh, more of the technology firms and try to uh, overcome some of that regional bias, but that was an interesting thing. We'll find out that that didn't matter as much in the knowledge of software security terms and concepts. Uh, okay, so here's the other thing. We tried to go get Greenfield folks, but we ended up having, if you notice, there's, you know, a big chunk had none, but we had a, a, a fair amount that had a, less than a day or two days. We had almost a hundred that had 
over three days training. That, that was surprising. At some point in their career, Cumulative had three days of software security training. The results don't reflect that. I'll, I'll, I'll just let you know that right now. So let me go back. Um, methodology, we picked 15 questions. And we did this peer review internally to the company. And we actually had a, a professor at the University of Texas in San Antonio that helped with this and provided oversight. We had a graduate assistant from the University of Texas at San Antonio that was a full-time worker on this for the last five months. So one thing I learned about this through this process is this is hard work and takes more than one guy to do part-time. Uh, but we picked these 15 questions and we, we vetted them. They targeted soft developers and distributed them, as I mentioned, online, hard copy versions. The, the, we had about 75 that we had a captive audience for in three different classroom settings and um, found out some interesting things there too. And then we put it on social media via Facebook and Twitter. And that's where we're going to probably double down afterwards to spend more time. And again, this is a... Very interesting results, but this, I, I think one of the things that will come out of this particular study is that there's need for more study. Um, so here are our basic hypotheses going in. We had some inklings, but the first one was we felt, you know, number one, that software developers still don't have a basic understanding of core software security concepts, AppSec concepts. Uh, number two, that the software security training can actually improve, you know, part of uh, somebody's uh, ability to understand and to deliver less vulnerable code. And then third, thirdly, this was one of my sub-hypotheses that actually was not borne out in our study, was that maybe the financial services guys have a head start. I mean, they're highly regulated. They have, you know, uh, we did not find that out to be the case. However, the sample size in the financial services was not what I wanted it to be. So there's an area going forward where we're going to spend some more time. So sample questions, you know, again, these are represent representative of the types of questions that we would ask uh, that, that like a basic person here should know. You know, what is authentication? Uh, we had, I would divide the questions into two areas. One, which is general AppSec awareness. You know, what is a cross-site scripting error? And then the other half of what, what would you do to fix a cross-site, or to prevent cross-site scripting errors? So that was the thought. Again, awareness and then more the prescriptive or defensive coding ideas. So there's some odd results and there's some real surprising ones. The first one is the very large organizations that we work with have the lowest secure coding knowledge. Uh, that might be turnover, that might be uh, a variety of things. I will say the people that we, the organizations that were representing the study were not uh, uh, the banks and largest financial institutions. So I think if you threw some of them in, that would change that a little bit. Uh, so that was a, uh, we, we, we looked at it two ways, by no, percentage of questions that were asked and by percentage of folks that passed. And we defined passing as 70%, which is, which is a modest, uh, 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 you know, a goal. Here's probably the first one that jumped out at me and our team is that, uh, first of all, that, that architects, as you might imagine, have a pretty decent idea of uh, software security concept, pretty good grasp. Uh, they were able to get you know, percentage correct, 64%, and then vast majority, uh, not vast majority, but they did pass. The QA guys, on the other hand, uh, were on the other end of the spectrum. Software developers fell in the middle. So the real challenge with this is, um, and we've, we've found this out talking to clients and kind of trying to socialize this after the, the, the survey, is number one, uh, many organizations view QA as a starting point for developers. They'll put uh, developers in out of college and they'll be working in QA for a while to work themselves up to the dev teams. Uh, we, we do that too at, at Denim Group. So that was interesting, but, but the challenge is, is that in, a, in many organizations, AppSec lives in QA, or at least they have a material role in the delivery of application security testing services. There's, there's some role. So if they are less suited or understanding these concepts uh, worse, that, that presents a challenge. Um, so here is the other thing that jumped out at us, is that uh, there was an awareness, uh, uh, you know, a grasp of basic awareness of AppSec uh, concepts. And 86% of the people understood what causes a cross-site uh, scripting error. But almost uh, across the board, they were ill-equipped or they did not respond well to the prescriptive uh, questions. How, how does one protect against a cross-site scripting error? So that's the gap, the real gap that jumped out is they, they you know, and largely fell down on the defensive coding and prescriptive side. Or how do you operationalize the AppSet concepts? It's great that you know them, but what we found throughout the studies uh, was, and particularly with one or two questions, the hows and wherefores of fixing these problems were just, they just bombed them. So 
here's the other interesting thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. We surveyed roughly 600 folks. Uh, out of that 600, we had over 100 that we didn't um, accept the results, or we, we, we considered throwing out. The reason for that is they did not complete one or more of the questions. So like they, you know, in that, what we found out from the survey and, you know, the political science world is that happens frequently, is you're going to get a good 15 to 20 percent of your, uh, they just get sample fatigue or they, they don't fill it out for whatever reason. But the interesting thing is they did not fill out some of the harder questions. So if you throw in those as all not rights or all wrong answers, all these results get worse. So we just did not include those. That was our approach and the feedback that we got from the, the folks, uh, the pr uh, professors at the University of Texas. But if you were to throw those in, the results would even be gloomier. So that's an interesting. Uh, uh. So they, again, they, they understood input validation. They understood uh, certain things. but. Um, uh, you know, they, they got certain things about session ID correct, 88% uh, of the folks did. Um, there was still a big chunk of folks that had no, no exposure. So I mentioned that we did have 95 that had more than three days. That surprised us. Um, a, a vast majority didn't. So this is one thing we know, and I know we've got, uh, you know, professors in higher ed here. I recognize a few guests. Um, at best, higher ed is teaching maybe one elective on secure development, and that elective probably deals with encryption for two or three months. You know, uh, I think Carnegie Mellon, a couple of Purdue, probably has a, a little bit more in depth. But for the most part, um, the professors will tell you, like, w you know, what class do you want to throw overboard? Like, I, I have them for really, you know, 60 hours or whatever it is of electives, my junior and senior year. And they have to learn about drivers. They have to learn about like basic, you know, compilers. They have to, so the challenge is, is they're not getting this. Uh, we know that. I sit on the industry advisory board for the University of Texas at San Antonio in their security group, and they, they, they have one class. And for I think it's next spring, they're teaching the first secure development class, which is not about encryption. It's about secure coding for the first time ever. So that'll be an interesting thing. So the, the kids coming out of school are not getting it. Here's the real big uh, surprise, particularly in the over 70, seven years, is there really is no correlation between experience and knowledge of security, secure coding. Um, and what this points to is a couple things. Number one, uh, you know, classic uh, learning environments is you can't just do this once and then expect people to remember it four years from now. I mean, the, the, the proverbial learning curve, <laughs> that does exist. So all those folks that had uh, three pl you know, plus years training, uh, they, you know, they, they didn't blow the, the, the questions and answers away. So we, I mentioned that, um, so the, but the good news is, is those that did have it, uh, three days or more at least got half the questions answered cor uh, correctly. So, uh, so there's some hope, but again, if you, if you divide those questions out between the awareness and the prescriptive ones, that's a little bit sobering. So um, we're, we're going to flesh that one out, but that was very interesting. Um, OK, so they know a little bit more about cross-site scripting after training. That's, 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 that's positive. That's good. Um, and, uh, and, and in general, the, the response were able to correctly identify what the concept of application security was after training. So, that, that, so there is hope uh, in that regard. Um, and so across the board, we noted that retention was about 25%. Again, these were before and after. What we haven't been able to do is before and after and six months after and a year after. I think that that's, that's an area for future analysis. The good news is, is bef uh, doing the before and after, we captured uh, the, the contacts data. So we have their data, they, they, uh, their personal data, not in a, not in a bad way. Uh, and we can go back and query them six months from now. So I mentioned we had about 600 respondents. We had to throw out about 100, and about 100 responded after as well, after some type of training. So interesting enough, th there was a timing component to this survey. Like we had to catch companies and organizations that were just starting software security initiatives or conducting classroom training. That's why the numbers are a little bit uh, lower. So uh, there is some hope there. So here's some things that we also learned in this process that, were, that really jumped out at us. That, that, you know, again, we have the benefit of, of living in this industry. We do these, uh, the classroom and e-learning training. But what we really learned, number one, is how different uh, companies teach versus the way software developers learn. And ironically, as I said, we have a lot of software developers. So first of all, the way companies teach is they teach via a couple of ways. One is, you know, formalized classroom training or 
what's very popular now is CBT or e-learning or on-demand learning that you, know, you get a link and you click on it and there's some verification. Um, the challenge is, uh, that, that, well, first of all, you have to do that because if you're running a thousand person dev team, you can't just wing it, right? You have to have something that's measurable as we discussed. So that, but that's the way companies approach training. Uh, they, oh, okay, there's an e-learning vendor that does this, bam, let's uh, license it for a thousand seats, problem solved. Uh, so they kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of will acquire a technology or they'll, or they'll go and uh, have classroom training. The unfortunate thing is, that's not how uh, software developers learn. So again, when I say software developers uh, learning, this is post undergraduate training, right? So everybody's been to college, most people have a CS degree, and from the point they graduate onward, virtually everything is informal. So what we learned, and we really, under, this is an, er an area for even further discussion, is how, how these folks learn. They don't go to classroom training anymore. They don't go and love e-learning as a, you know, they just don't. Uh, and to some degree, this is how they learn. Like they pick up, you know, everybody that's learned Android or iOS, they didn't go to like a four-day iOS class to pick up uh, this, or if they're learning, you know, a, a new language, Ruby, or a new framework, they don't go to like a four-day class to, or, you know, off to, to, uh, to a class. They learn quickly, they learn informally, they learn through social networks, they learn by doing. And that is a big, big point. If you are in the unenviable or enviable position of rolling out one of these programs, you have to take that into consideration. Uh, morphing a little bit of what you, uh, the formal uh, structure for training uh, and, and actually kind of uh, uh, adapt it to the way uh, developers learn. Here's the other thing. I mean, this is basic stuff, but don't forget basic learning curve issues. And the bottom line is, uh, if you teach and then four years later expect uh, the folks to remember it, they will not. You have to have some kind of refresher, usually in bits, bite-sized bits, uh, you know, a security awareness, uh, maybe driven by one of the dev team leads or by the software security lead. Um, taking what we've seen as a best practice is taking real stories that, you know, hey, this, this breach happened, um, let's, what are the lessons learned and how is that important to us? Those kind of real learning uh, and, uh, situations are fantastic. It ha I've seen the best companies have figured out how to get it in the developer's performance plans, where they say, hey, you know, that's how they're held accountable. Like, if you're asking me to take eight hours of training and I'm not rewarded for that, like, this is just, like, something I gotta do, you know? Uh, but if I've seen the sophisticated organizations put that as some kind of MBO or some type of uh, learning goal for the year. You know, hey, you have to do this and understand it. And then, again, be ready to answer the ROI question, even if it's intangible, uh, because uh, that's the way the world works. Post-2008, uh, you know, managers are not looking to spend more money. They're looking to say, here's, here's $100,000 to do training. Show me. Show me how that, you know, per lines of code, we are more secure, or lack of, of vulnerabilities, lack of, uh, of, of breaches. So that's an important thing. Um, the other thing I would throw in there is incentives matter. Uh, I, I, uh, and if you don't think they do, uh, they do. Uh, so uh, I, I, we did this classroom training, 75 students. We had 25 fully completed surveys before and after. And I was, I was completely at my wit's end. So captive audience, kind of like y'all, we sat down before the training. Here you go, fill these out. Uh, we didn't have any incentives. We should have. We should have said, hey, here's your iPod or here's something uh, at the end of the class. We did it afterwards. We did three classes back to back to back. Out of 75 students, we got 25 completed before and afters. Either they just didn't do the after or they did part of it or they didn't, you know. So that was shocking to us. And the same thing bore out in the Survey Monkey things that we'd send out to organizations that we'd get like a chunk of them back. Like you just, and, and again, factor in the not knowing component. So what we ended up doing at the very end is we wanted to get more financial services and more representation outside of um, our backyard. So we did it, uh, the social media deal. We did that for a while and then we threw a $100 Amazon card on it and virtually every survey from that point forward was filled out completely. And uh, if you think you're above, above that, I would just point out, uh, for those that are going trick-or-treating, uh, at, at, I mean, like, we're, we're, you know, to some degree, this stuff works. And absent of it in your pro programs, you will probably fall, you'll be surprised, like we were surprised. So again, captive audiences, you have to have something, even if it's uh, kind of 
uh, silly and kind of superficial and like swag at a trade show, it, it, it actually works. Okay, so the conclusions uh, that I, uh, to open up uh, time for questions and answers is number one, the software developers still do not largely understand key software security concepts. Um, with the definition of 70% is passing, 73% failed. Um, however, software uh, developers' understanding of key software security concepts actually got better, roughly 25%. The key question will be down the line and when they change into different frameworks and do whatever. So that there is an impact. To put it another way, the utter absence of this training is probably going to produce the results that we can anticipate. So where do we go from here? Um, there's two things that we plan to do after this. This has been a, a major effort, bigger than what we uh, thought for an OWASP AppSec presentation. I'll just let, leave it at that. Um, we want to do two things. Number one, we want to keep the, uh, the survey going. I want to spend more time with and get a little tease out more information from the financial sector. I think we're underrepresented there. Uh, get rid of a little bit of the geographic bias. Uh, and the, the second thing is we're going to publish this in the form of a white paper uh, later this year when I can finally write it up. Uh, the survey component of this took a tremendous amount of activity. And like I said, we had a full-time graduate assistant. I'm not sure we're going to have the appetite to do another survey for the 2014 AppSec, but it was very interesting. And the results, uh, we're, we're doing secondary analysis as another uh, component of this. The one thing that we're trying to figure out is like you throw out the um, over seven years of folks, there's some interesting things. And if we do this again, we'll do it so we can uh, break up that over seven years group and, and know a little bit more about that. That was probably a, uh, the grouping of that survey class was not, uh, turned out to be less than uh, fantastic. So with that, um, I've got time for, substantial time for questions and answers, which I suspect, uh, well, I hope we have. <laughs> yes, sir. On the one slide, you had uh, people who had zero training versus three days of training in the past, what percentage passed and didn't pass. Yeah. It was like, there was only a 4% difference between no training and three days of training in the past. I think that's a retention. It points to retention is what we think. That's our, that's our, uh, that's our initial analysis of it, is the retention issue. So like you've had three days of training, what we didn't ask is how long ago was that? Yeah, that's where And again, what, and, and then the other one is like, was that the architects that answered that question or the general devs? So there's like, there is so much data here. So part of it is we want to expose this and, and get it out there because you're right, there's so many secondary questions. I uh, think, like I said, the, the over seven years thing jumped out at me immediately. And, and I have the anecdotal experience of having trained some of the, uh, I'd just come off of a, uh, a training session with a state government where literally I walked in and I'm the youngest guy there. I was like, wow. And then, you know, and versus our group where they're all 22 and I th they call me sir and dad or kind of, you know, like, uh, I, they could be my children. But, but, but uh, that's, that's a, uh, a huge, huge eye opener. And I think that's the case in the energy sector. Correct me if I'm to wrong, Tom, is that the, uh, that uh, you know, if you go to Houston or go to the, uh, big big oil services companies or the big uh, upstream guys, the developers are just older, at least in their late 30s, probably. Yeah, you start in the back. Okay, or either, or in the front. I volunteer at a forum, and one of the things I see is people who are either learning from books or work for small companies that can't afford training are still not aware that SQL injection even exists. Do you have any suggestions on how to go about educating people like that? Well, what we've seen that's successful is you get the one person, that dev team, that kind of understands security, and you let that person teach the rest. I mean. Um, uh, I think uh, Brad Arkin and the guys at Adobe have done a good job of figuring out who within the dev teams are the, the actual entry points. Uh, but some, some example like that. They, the, the irony of all this is that, you know, as a security person, you can't mandate the dev teams do this. So you kind of have to sell uh, them on the concept of doing this to some degree. Um, and what, if there is no top-down imperative to do it, then, you know, finding that person on the, uh, the dev team that kind of took the, that one class and, uh, and loves cryptography or whatever, you get that person to leverage them is what I've seen to be successful in non-regulated, non-compliance environments. So the, again, I, 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 you know, I've said this before publicly, you wake up and we realize we're actually in sales and marketing uh, to the dev teams. And uh, that is the irony for what we do, so. Yes, sir. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on taking this a step further and looking at how uh, specific developers are trained in tying back the training improvements to their code quality. So for example, they start at point A 
and we know that we have security issues and software programs that they're responsible for and then tracking over time how they might improve um, based on yeah, their, I, the training initiatives. So, so this is such, you know, I'm not going to quit my day job and go work for a polling company, right? Uh, but but what, what we learned real quickly is there is a, and when we did background research, and again, I had a graduate assistant and I did a peer review with a professor, there is just a dearth of information on this topic, period. Uh, so one of the outcomes we have is like, what's the next set of studies? Um, and absent of incentives, you're not going to get developers. If, if developers don't like formalized training, they sure as heck don't like doing surveys. That's the other thing I, I, I would throw in there. Uh, you know, uh, so, so like, how do you study a group of folks? You know, this is almost like a social, a sociology project, you know, a, a group that comes in and here they are, here's your dev team in 2013. What do they look like? Uh, four years from now, you know, what's the, what's the turnover? Do they get these concepts? Uh, but I found that it has to be current, it has to be relevant, interesting, and uh, emphasized throughout. So the answer is there, there's so many different vectors that we could take off of this. I want I'm, for those that are interested, email me or, or send me a Twitter DM. And uh, but but one of the assumptions going forward is that I you know I will probably look for another graduate assistant. There's there's, there's a lot of work behind this and. Uh, and, you know, um, again, Gartner's not going to, they're not worried about losing their day, day jobs either. I mean, surveying and interviewing is an intensive project process and all, also is frustrating when you realize, like, we had 75 students that were a captive audience for two days and they didn't, you know, two-thirds of them didn't fill out the, the surveys. Like, what happened? Yeah, so a lot of work to come out of this. I think a lot more ideas. Uh, we're hoping to tease those out in the white paper. Yes. Oh, sorry. Are there any plans to uh, maybe expand your survey your question? Because it seemed like you're, you're saying your, your whole survey was based on security-related questions. And I know you had the demographic of how much experience developers had, but did you try to do any baseline to correlate their uh, results on security-related questions uh, versus so, on average development questions? Okay, so uh, and that's a good point. And the other thing is, is the you know, feedback we've gotten is you need to uh, also consider the general way people learn and, 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 and look at the difference in that. I would say two things. First of all, we didn't ask security questions per se. That, uh, we ask questions on secure development concepts and then how to implement those in coding. And so there were questions that we had originally had, like, what's your awareness of HIPAA and things. So all those kind of like general security stuff we threw out. It's really for developers and that. Um, the answer is, is that we could probably get better sets of questions or, you know, code snippets are probably the best way. Uh, but language dependencies and framework dependencies and all that are, are just too much of a challenge. Uh, you know, our I will share, will gladly share the actual questions with everybody and the data. So again, email me or DM me or give me a card. But the 15 questions are pretty ones that we should at least get, I would think in this group, 90% correct. You know, a good 12 or 13 out of 15. They're basic ones that even non-developers could, could probably get. If you, if you did the CISSP or the CSSLP, which, which doesn't mean you have to know anything about secure coding, you can like read it, read about it you could probably pass this. So you don't have to actually be an AppSec guru or a coder. You, could pr you just have to be able to mouth the words. And what we're saying is the developers could not mouth the words. So there's a lot, I'm, I'm, you know, again, a lot of follow-up on this. this. This kicks open the can of worms in a way that we didn't fully understand either. Yes, sir. Um, hitting on your topic of getting the developers to do this, um, in my company we found that um, in addition to the time you know, they, they view it as a compliance thing that they yeah. have to get checked off. And so they don't, they see it as something that takes them away from their job of developing. And so that's a huge hurdle to overcome. But when we've gotten them in the room and show them how a SQL injection vulnerability, and then you can own the database and their jaws drop and the light goes on, then they start to get it. And, and I'm wondering, how, how do you deal with that? Well, number one, one thing we did confirm is it does take them away from their day job, right? Versus the 15-minute snippet for security awareness. It's eight hours or two days. That's, that's different. Um, again, 
uh, absent of compliance or top-down imperative, you have got to, you know, essentially get them on board and train them. And, and, and that uh, the way that I've seen it best done is uh, do brown bag entertainment thing. You'll, you'll, you're you're going to get the right the people that care are going to come to the brown bag, and then you pick them off as your as your local ombudsman or your local point of contact. So bring free pizza or something. Free right? pizza, a beer, uh, bribery, incentives. You know, <laughs> again. Um, if they don't view this to be central to their role, now that's changing. And I think in financial, you know, fi financial services and banks, that this is central to what they do. There is a vast gap between uh, the way the big banks do things and the way the big, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing companies uh, do things in the software security world. And, and so it sounds like you're kind of also um, saying engaging top management. Well, okay, least, so let, let me give you a great level. example. And this is a, a war story that Dan Cornell tells all the time. He did training at one of the major airlines, and I won't say which one, probably about four or five years ago, and nobody told them uh, why they were there. So we had 25 people, and we did like six days in a row, and the first day they're like, why are we here? And so all, you know, like why, am I, I just got this meeting request and Outlook showed up, I showed up, it's a training day, it's the equivalent of going to the zoo or having a day off. Like I'm, I'm in training, entertain me, I'm doing my work. And what Dan did is throughout the day scared them progressively enough for they, so they did pay attention. This is opposed to another environment, a retail environment where the CFO had a, uh, for the Fortune 500 com company, uh, recorded a little snippet of him saying, this is why this is important for all of y'all. We hold precious customer data. You saw what happened at this company. You saw what happened at this company. We don't want that to happen with our company. Pay attention. This is important to me and important to our company. That little step got them to turn on. So th those are little guerrilla marketing tactics that you have to do. You know, that invoking the CFO. You can't do that. CFO can do that. They won't pay attention if you do it. Here's a security guy saying, pay attention. You know, who cares? I don't even know his name. Um, but the CFO will get that attention. So that was kind of a cool way to leverage that. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, so I agree with your um, slide where you're talking about how the short snippets work and the like less than 15 minutes, whether it be social media or blogs, and that the long online courses just aren't effective at They're learning. Training, yeah. yeah. S yet, how do you deal with um, the management concept, though, that they need compliance? So how do you track 15 minutes that seem to be optional? Do you make those mandatory? Or is, are auditors and satisfied with many different blends of how you're educating your users? So again, the focus of this was the study and survey itself. But I, I think what it points to are things like uh, not making people do training just for training's sake. So I'll give you a great example is uh, sending out a screening uh, pre-quiz. If you pass it, you don't have to go back and take the module. Well, guess what? You know, 30% uh, of people pass it. They don't have to take that. That's, that's a cool way of doing it uh, so that in, in, or maybe even mention that when you do the training that, hey, we're going to quiz you in July. And if you, if you remember this stuff and pass it, you don't ever have to look at this again. Um, so that's, that's one way to do it. But there is no great, I mean, what I'm this is not an e-learning or a training strategy presentation. But what I'm telling you is if you do it and just release e-learning out there or make people go to classroom training, don't expect the results to be linear. I mean, like you have to. Uh, you have to cast it through the lens that developers train, and that might mean breaking it up and make it harder. It will be harder to do that tracking and all that. It's not easy. But the results are is if you, and, and all the vendors that do this that are in here that they roll out e learning, you know, like you turn it on, there's not like some rat rush to, for all the developers to consume it, you know. So we've seen it. It's like, wait, nobody's logged in. Like, we knew that was going to be the case. So it has to be in concert with some kind of awareness event, some kind of incentive, getting a dev manager on board who can say, hey, I just took this, it's pretty cool. And you know, when we built this app two weeks ago, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, like making it personal and making, and making it come from the dev side, if that makes sense. So there's no great answers. But this, this, this further, I think, cements the point that you cannot just do the stock answer of formalized training. Yes, sir. Yeah, just to add to that, what we do where I work is developers don't want to get a three-hour training all at once and have everything thrown at them. They don't retain it. You've got to kind of take a risk-based approach and say, do I really care about log forging if you have SQL injection? Do I really care about 
um, a, a cookie being set secure when you've got parameter tampering. Those are the things you have to focus on. And so instead of just sending like a one day, two day training, we'll do like an hour and a half on SQL injection, cross-site scripting, parameter tampering. Make sure they've got those, then we'll work on the other stuff. But if you've got those main ones, those are the ones that you can really show with SQL injection, you can own the database, which you can do with it, and, and do demos for them. They retain that a lot better. I, I found that, uh, to answer the previous question, another interesting thing is you pick one example from the dev team. So if it's not, if you don't do that, they will view the, the threat as abstract, or the risk as abstract. But if you yeah. pick one app, and say, for example, and then suddenly everybody swivels, and they're like, oh, "Okay." So that, I think that's another emerging best practice: is don't just uh, you know don't just train them, but train them, find, build a little bit of time or resources in there to pick an app that maybe the pen test just blew up or that you just scan, and and show them how this manifests itself. I mean, to scare them, thing. we grab headlines and say, "Look at this company, one of our competitors, they were hacked." You, we don't want our name there. With so, this thing, so and then that's what, the real successful guys are able to take those stories and not just scare people, not just forward links, but just say, "Here's why this is this is what the impact was on that particular thing, and here's what, where we think our risk is or the impact to us." If you can tell that story through that lens, it's much more powerful. I found. Any more questions? Alrighty, thanks for your time, and like I said, I'll hang around.